Morning, church. We'll get started. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll get into the program that's planned for the day. Brother Monty, would you mind praying for us, please, to open? Indeed. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for waking us up this morning to gather together on this your Holy Sabbath day. As we worship in your name, Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit be with us through the course of the day. And help us to focus on you and forget all the all words and cares. It's your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. How is everyone today? How are we all doing? I see numerous thumbs up. Numerous thumbs up. I like it. I like it. Good morning, Albert Lawrence. Sister Bev. Sister and brother Macintosh. Sister Beverly Barry, how are you doing? Arda Herbert. Brother and sister, brother Scarlett, hello. Hey. Hello. <laughs> hello. Hello. We have a, a, a face to put to the voice. <laughs> Thank you. The Herbert and the Tabby family. Good to have you all with us today. Sister Jean, how you doing? Hi, friend. Good to see you all. We're going to have our opening hymn, which is hymn 434. We speak of the realms. It's taken from Psalms 91. And we're reading verses 1 to 9. Bear with me one second. Having some technical difficulties. So, Psalm 21, verses 1 to 9, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. And it reads, 
He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will trust. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Verse five, you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall come near you. Only with your eye shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Verse nine, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. Amen. I pray that we will have some understanding of God's word as we study our lesson this week. At this time, we'll separate for our classes. We will have our youth class going in their direction and we will break into our class. And before we do so, we'll just have a word of prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for the lesson and the, your word that you've opened to us this week. Lord, as we embark upon our study, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would lead us. May we put our opinion secondary, dear Lord, to the leading of your Holy Spirit. May you enlighten us. May you fill us. May you give us a word this morning. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. 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 This week, the adult lesson, we're studying under the topic of feet of the Assyrians and the lesson will be facilitated or taught or whatever you want to call it by myself and Sister Suki. I'll throw over to Suki to open for us with the historical context of what we're looking at this week in Isaiah. So good morning class. Good morning. Me again. Me again, yeah. So uh, we're looking at uh, we're still in the book of Isaiah, and we've experienced quite a few things over the last few weeks. The story from this week starts in Isaiah 36, and just to give you a bit of historical context around what has happened at that time, and you know, interestingly, while Otis and I were preparing for this week's lesson, just the history alone, I feel like is a two-hour Bible study just by itself. So I'm going to try and give you a really brief snapshot. So when we open in Isaiah 36, we realize that we're beginning in the 14th year of Hezekiah's reign, which uh, historically we can see is 701 BC. Now, at that time, Hezekiah has been ruling 14 years. He's inherited an alliance with Assyria which uh, was part of the agreement that Ahaz had with Assyria at the time. Now, when he inherited this alliance with Assyria, he actually broke it off and went to great lengths to restore um, what was right and do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Now, at this time, the Assyrian army had been on a bit of a rampage and the Assyrian army was strong, very, very strong, very well equipped, very strategic in their... Um, way in which they had been built up as an army. They had infantry, they had chariot men, they had horsemen, they had strategy, they had generals. You know, they really knew what they were doing when it came to going in, conquering a land, dissecting it, pillaging it, and, you know, being an effective army. Now, in contrast to that, we look at Judah's army, and it was literally like you or me going to war. You know, I don't know about your warring skills, but I know mine are terrible. So, you know, Judah's army was made up of mercenaries at best you know at best but the rest of them were really untrained soldiers unskilled in the art of war in, they didn't really have an infantry that were as well equipped as the Assyrian army they had no chariot or horsemen which is why we see in um later on in the text when Rabshakeh is mocking um the the Israelites and he's referring to Egyptian horsemen and chariots and how he'll provide 2,000 horsemen is because the Judah army didn't even have one. They didn't have that themselves. Now, the conquering of Lashish, which is what is quoted at this time. So Lashish was um, one of the many cities that uh, Sennacherib um, had conquered as part of his rule as a Syrian king. Now, the reason why this particular city is uh, 
earmarked and is quoted in in the text because lots of reasons but number one it was the second most important fortified city in Judah at that time next to Jerusalem it was guarding the main road from Egypt to Jerusalem so the thoroughfare of trade um, the route to, to the expansion of the empire all those things sat at that location it was it was um on a high point that had a northern and a southern slope, quite steep. It was at a high vantage point. And throughout probably 500 years, Lashish sat within Judah's rule in the Judea kingdom. And it defended the kingdom against Philistine attacks on one frontier. You know, they could see from all around. It was a very, very important strategic location for Judea at the time. Now, we can also see that throughout history, Lashish has also served as a strategic location for other kings of Judah. So we can see that King Rehoboam, who was a son of Solomon in Second Chronicles, he, used, he actually started building the fortifications for that city. We can also see that King Amaziah, who was the son of Joash, found refuge and shelter in Lashish at the time. So again, that's found in um, 2 Kings uh, verses 40, um, chapter 14, 13 and in 2 Chronicles chapter 25. Now, that so important was this story was that actually at the time they made reliefs, which are like wooden, not wooden, uh, like stone tablets telling the story, a bit like the Bayou Tapestry, which talks about, you know, King William and um, Harold and the Conqueror and stuff like that. It was their version of that at the time. So they had carved out on stone meticulously and in high detail. I'd highly encourage you to Google it because the impressions are very, very impressive. But it, they carved these on the walls and they had told the story of how amazing the conquering of Ashish had been. Now, the reason why, again, why that is so important is because that whole experience, the, think about the mindset that the Judea people were in when um, Sennacherib and Rabshakeh came to them with the proposition that Rabshakeh came with. They had experienced a significant defeat. The story of Lashish was famous, renowned around the, the old world at that time. And they, at that time, because it was one of their most important cities, were almost in disbelief that it had actually been conquered because they had had it for so long, they had occupied it for so long, and that is where I'm going to hand over to Otis to talk a little bit about Rabshaka and what he's coming with. Rab, the Rabshaka, the Rabshaka, you know, at first you read this, the Rabshaka, and you think it's the name of a person, but the Rabshaka is actually a title of this individual. Um, Rab meaning chief, and Shaka, there's some debate about the importance of his role, whether it was just a regular cupbearer, which would transliterate as a butler. Um, but by the context of the text, we can see that the Rabshakeh was a leader of um, Sennacherib's kingdom. He was a leader of his army, a captain of the hosts. He was an important official in the Assyrian land. Um, question, or well, before the question, when I hear Rabshakeh talking, for me, what I'm hearing is the voice, the words, the sentiment of Sennacherib, because all that Rab, the Rabshaka was really communicating was not his own, his own ideas, but was just communicating the message from the king. And so I might use those two kind of synonymously. But when you hear the words of the Rabshaka, and when you see how he is carrying himself and how he is going on with himself, who does he remind you of? Let's go to um, Isaiah 36, um, verse 6 and 7. Just a couple of verses from Isaiah 36. Isaiah 36, verse 6 and 7. And any thoughts from your own study? When we listen to the words of, of the Rabshakeh, who does he remind you of? Satan. That was my thought too. Yeah. That was my thought too. He reminds me of Satan. Yeah. Very boastful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Isaiah 36, um, 6 and 7. Yeah. Look, do you want me to read it out, Otis? If you got it for you. Look, you are, tr I'm reading from the New King James Version, sorry. Look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. 
So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all, to all who trust in him. Verse 7. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? Thank you. So someone tell me about the, the tactics. Tell me about the uh, what we would, in this day and age, might call sight ups psychological operations that um, the Rabshakeh is running on Hezekiah and the, the men at the wall and the officials that went to meet them. What is the approach of the Rabshakeh and Sennacherib through him? What is attitude towards God's people and towards God himself effectively? Well, he's saying here that you can't trust the Egyptians because they're weak as an ally, they're useless. And he's also saying that Hezekiah offended God by taking away altars in other places. So if Hezekiah has offended God, God won't come to his aid. So in other words, you have no allies. You're on your own against us, a mighty mm -hmm. army. So he's planting the seeds of doubt about this, the Egypt. They are not so reliable. Um, are you even in good standing with God? Are you on the right side of God? Is God coming to your aid? Haven't you offended him by doing X, Y, or Z? Anybody else? What else are we seeing from the approach of the Rabshakeh? I'm seeing lots of red muted microphones here, so I'm not sure many people have intention of speaking. What else are we seeing from the Rabshakeh? I just want to draw upon Monty's point where he said Satan. So for me, mm. there are specific points in the Bible where Rabshakeh is mimicking or is representing a character like Satan. So mm. what came to mind for me was the serpent in the garden. So when he, the serpent came to Eve and it was like... Mm, maybe maybe not are you sure that's the right thing mm, are you sure that's what god said mm, you know not directly standing in opposition against god's word but just sowing the seed of doubt bringing reasonable doubt into the conversation so that the person on the receiving end of that conversation is the one that construes that information one way or the other and similarly thinking about how satan when he was tempting jesus in the wilderness Satan was there saying to Jesus, well, you know, if you really were this person, if you really did this, if you really could, again, mm. suggesting um, that there is mistruths or there are lies in the word of God by saying, mm, are you sure? Maybe. Mm. And, you know, interestingly, when Rabshakeh comes to um, the, the three people that he speaks to at the time, the, you know, the recorder and all the rest of it, the chief, um, and the people are on the wall outside the city gates, and um, he's speaking in um, Hebrew. I thought that was particularly interesting because, you know, when Satan comes to you, he doesn't talk to you in a way that makes you feel away. He talks to you on your terms, talks to you in your language, says the things, does the things that resonate with you directly. And this is how Rabshakeh was going on, mm -hmm. I thought. Yeah. Indeed, I saw some unmuting going on. Um, anybody like to make comments? For the Who Donald? wants to earn some gold stars today? <laughs> uh, what it reminded me as well is how easy it is for us to be caught up in conspiracies and from sources that often we don't even know where yeah. it's coming from but we are willing to, to actually accept yeah. it because part of the issue is that uh, as Suki said if it accords with what you may be thinking mm -hmm. or you have that doubt, mm -hmm. then the conspiracies will come to you and further enhance that. Yeah. Because, and you don't necessarily check, mm -hmm. is it really coming from a source that can be trusted? Mm -hmm. It's funny you say that because I think it was, was it last night, Suki, when I was talking about the fact that Essentially, we all believe what we want to believe. Yeah. You know, and when somebody doesn't want to believe something, they will tell you that the reason they don't believe it is because there isn't yet enough evidence or proof to back up this thing. Yet, okay. there is enough evidence for some people to believe, but this individual or you or me have decided, I am not going to believe that. And so for the most part, yeah, you're right. We believe what we want to believe. And then we seek out evidence to back up our belief and to disregard other beliefs. Uh, we would be much better off placing our beliefs on the word of God and working backwards from there. Because who can you go to or where can you go in this world to get 100% reliable true news? 
It doesn't oh, exist. So. There's always some kind of bias of some description. And I think yes. Go on, sorry. Look at Brother Monty's hand up. Yeah. I wasn't saying the underlying factor in all of this is fear. Yes, um, yeah. Back in the, 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 the lesson study, um, Rabshak came, he instilled fear and he yeah. played on their weakness. And even in today's um, world as we live, we are, everything's underpinned by fear, fear of the unknown or fear of the information we're getting. And Satan works on our fears because he knows it's our weakest point. And he drums it gently, slowly, but consistently until it becomes almost immovable that when the truth comes to those who don't believe, it's hard to dislodge it. Oh, so referring, referring back to the word of God is the only thing we can be sure that is true. Most certainly. I'm coming to you next, Sister Sherelle, but before I do that, along the same lines, the Rabshaka, he, like Sister Suki said, there's parallels with how the serpent moved in the Garden of Eden. Can you really trust God's word? Is God's word really true? Um, notice when the Rabshaka is lumping the God of Israel, the true God, the creator God, in with the, the gods of the people around them. And notice around you in today's world that the naysayers do the same thing. So they look at all these false gods and all these fake religions and all these false beliefs, and then they lump in the real God, the true God, in the midst of that and make no attempt or be completely unwilling to try to discern between true and false. There's just, look, you got all these fake gods, and so I'm just not even going to entertain this God that you say is real. Yes, Sister Sherelle. I was just um, adding to after with verse six and seven, after he planted all those um, seeds, you know, he, in verse eight, you notice he said, now, therefore, I urge you, like, it's like he is forcing now, like there's an urgency for him to choose or make a choice right there and then, you know? So it's like the swiftness of how we want him to um, make a decision that um, alone just tell you that, you know, it's something got to be wrong, you know what I mean? <laughs> Why he had definitely. to make a choice right there and then, you know, it hurted him to make a choice. Most start, definitely. You know? Most yeah. definitely. I think that there is a, another application to us. I'm going to come to you in a minute, so I'm going to move on to Hezekiah. I think there's another application for us in that sometimes we look at the scripture and we think, right, we're going to look to Hezekiah to see what characteristics of his can we aspire to. And we look at that mean old Sennacherib and the mean old Rabshaka and we'll boo, dismiss them. But if we're not careful, if we are flagrantly and openly going against what God has said in his word, we find ourselves replicating the attack of the Rabshaka, replicating the approach of the enemy when we are openly and flagrantly saying to God, yeah, you said this one thing, but nah, I'm going to do this other thing over here. And as God says, when he responded to the prayer of Isaiah, he's saying, you know, he's not mocking you. You know, when the people come against your belief or against your God or against your Sabbath, you might feel ashamed or put out at the time, but they're not mocking you. They're, they're going against God. And if we understand that, it should do two things. One, it should mean that we get less offended and we are less personally slighted. But also, we should have, as Hezekiah did, the faith to know that in the end, God will, God will avenge his enemies. He will ensure that his word has been backed up and secured. And so we just need to rest in the faith, knowing that maybe for the, for the time being, and we're going to speak about this in a little while, God uses the hardship of his people, or he intends to, as a witness to the people around. And God cannot do that. If God allows you to be always in the ascendancy, always successful, always doing amazingly well, then it's kind of just par for the course. When God allows you in the eyes of the people to be defamed and to be seen to be struggling and suffering and losing, and then God miraculously steps in and overhauls the situation. The, the credit cannot belong to anybody else other than God. And that's why we need to have faith to be able to go through those tough times. Um, Suki, are you going to talk about Hezekiah? 
Uh, yeah, before we move on to that, though, there's just a couple of things that I wanted to bring again to our um, thinking as we go through the rest of the lesson. So when we believe we are Bible believing Christians, we believe in sola scriptura. So we know that in Ecclesiastes, it says King Solomon, the wiser king to ever have lived and to live. There is no new thing under the sun. So when we're reading these factual historical accounts of what happened to Rabshakeh, Sennacherib and Hezekiah, when we look at how that unfolded, what transpired, we can see a direct application in the way in which we're living today and how we can use these lessons to benefit from us. That's the first thing. The second thing that I also want to say is that we know that the Bible was written for our learning so that we may know many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have died uh, over history we can see that in order for us to have the privilege of this word in our laps today so when we read the bible and we look at the stories we know that everything was written for our learning and that we have nothing to fear except that we don't pay attention to how god has led people in the past so when we miss that message of this week's story we miss the value of the lessons so when we look at rabshika and how he was flexing and the things that he was going on yes he was being deceitful he was relying upon things that people could see touch and feel the defeat at lashish the experience of the more developed army the threat of the siege the threat of these people having to eat their own drink their own waste for fear of them being under siege by the size of their army you know these are very real visceral images that we could relate to and be like oh my gosh i, don't, I definitely don't want that um whereas god asks us in the bible to rely upon things that are unseen to put our stores and our treasures in places that we cannot see so when we look at hezekiah and how he took this learning or appreciation because obviously at that time king solomon had also you know been the wisest king he knew of the story of solomon and how you know he solomon himself had come to a demise from straying away from god's word we can see that the way hezekiah was flexing was potentially not necessarily heeding that message as closely as he should have done so when we look at hezekiah so at the beginning of the story when we learn that it's in the 14th year of his reign we also know that he died in the 29th year of his reign. So Hezekiah's experience on a personal level, aside from what's going on, there's two things happening here. One, the threat of the king of Assyria is knocking on his door. Number two, we also know that Isaiah the prophet has come to him and said, guess what, mate, you need to get your house in order. Because, And so we know that Hezekiah is experiencing those two things concurrently. They're not happening mutually exclusively they're happening at the same time so we see that hezekiah's response is what what's hezekiah's first response to um we see that in chapter 37 at the beginning of the chapter verses two to seven what's the first thing that hezekiah does anyone that's got it can read it out Thirty-seven, two, two, what? 2 to 7 right and he sent Eliakim, who yeah. was over the household, and Shebna the scribe and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth unto Isaiah the prophet of the son of Ammon. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and of blasphemy, for the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. It may be the Lord thy God will hear the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, had sent to reproach the living God and reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath had heard. Wherefore, lift up their prayer for the remnant that is left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall ye say unto your master, Thus said the Lord, be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Thank you. So what is amazing about this text is that before Hezekiah has even got down on his knees, before he's even got into the space. Yeah, I don't know about you, but when I come to prayer, I need to like get in the zone. 
to, you know what I mean? Like you need to get ready. You need to make sure no children are disturbing you. You've got time. You know what you're going to pray about. Before Hezekiah's even thought about what he's going to pray about, Isaiah has already delivered assurance that God has already prescribed an answer to that prayer. So before Hezekiah's even got on his knees, before he's got on his sackcloth, before whatever, Isaiah is coming and saying to him, you need to pray, put your, lift your prayer up to the Lord. But you know what? Before you even do that, let me just tell you, God has already got the result and the answer and the solution, the deliverance has already been prescribed. And he, at this point, Isaiah prophesies about Sennacherib's, Sennacherib's I can't say the name properly, um, what's going to happen to him, which is that he will die in his own land. And interestingly, when we look at the historical references, sorry, Otis, I'll come to you in one second. When we come to the historical references of Sennacherib, so Sennacherib was a very famous Assyrian king. There's loads of texts about him textbooks wikipedia you know you name you can find them everywhere but when you actually look at a why he withdrew his troops from judah and two how he died we see that in both all the secular resources that there are they always quote the bible interestingly so they will say there's no real reasons to why Sennacherib pulled his troops we don't know but the bible says that an angel of the lord killed his army we have no proof to the contrary and that's a secular resource that's saying that. Second of all, when we look at how Sennacherib was an almighty king and he went back to his own land and was murdered by his own people, the fall of his kingdom came about from within. We see another historical reference of how that's happened, and that's in the Roman Empire. So we have all these instances again and again and again and again of the times that we're living in, of how history has rolled itself out where the prophecies of um, the Bible are coming true again and again. Otis, you were going to say. I just want to go back a little bit, because yep. I think that to help us understand Hezekiah, his actions, his response, it would help us understand more about the gentleman himself. The first thing that we need to check about Hezekiah is that when he, he came on the throne, he embarked upon reform. He embarked upon religious reform in the land. And it's important to understand, to help us know who Hezekiah was. So if you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 29, um, 2 Chronicles chapter 29, so you have some parallel texts in Isaiah 36 to 39, you have 2 Chronicles, and I believe about 28 to 32, and you have um, 2 Kings um, 18, 19, which are telling the same portion of history from this time. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, 1 to 5, we read Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and 20 years old, and he reigned nine and 20 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the East Street and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves, and sanctify the house of the Lord, God of your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. And if we jump forward to 17 to 19, now they began on the first day of the first month to sanctify, and on the eighth day of the month came they to the porch of the Lord. So they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days, and in the sixteenth day of the first month they made an end. Then they went into Hezekiah the king and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord and all the altar of burnt offering, with all the vessels thereof, and the showbread table, with all the vessels thereof. Moreover, all the vessels <laughs> which King Ahaz in his reign did cast away in his transgression have we prepared and sanctified, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. And so Ahaz, when he came to a point of trial, as I would suspect some of us do at times, you know, at the point of trial is not the moment to be trying to develop a saving faith in the Lord. Yeah, so yeah. if we are waiting until the, you know, the testing should come before yeah. we want to then try to polish off our spirituality and refine our devotion life, whilst God is merciful, yeah. I think it's not that we are robbing ourselves of the blessing. Yeah. We are robbing ourselves of the relationship with God that we need to see us through these times. And I would suggest that it's not going to be possible to develop a saving faith 
in the midst of the storm. Yes, we, need to, we need to be approaching the test already with some lamp trimmed and burning. You know, the, the 10 virgins, when they got up, they all had a little bit to, to, to light it off in the first place. But then when it came to it, the five of them hadn't prepared, they hadn't made the necessary preparation. We need to be preparing before, before the army is at the wall. Yes, Brother Donald. Yeah, just trying to, it's a question, I think. Um, he obviously tried to come and make some reforms and on his taking up his um, the, um, the throne. Um, and whilst it was easy to do some of the, in terms of the temple and the buildings, to make changes there, one of the challenges then came about the people themselves in terms of changing their, getting them to reform. And I think it's, it's a lesson to us in many respects that we can change the physical appearance of things at times, but that doesn't necessarily mean it goes to the heart of changing people. It is a much more challenging and in effect, more work has to be done in preparation for that than it is in terms of getting people to take on board the changes in a physical sense. Yep, certainly. And I think for me, so for me, there's I have picked out some of the major themes of this scripture, which I spent most of the time reading this week. And for me, one of the real critical themes of what we're studying is where we need to get to as Christians, which is where literally I could see something with my eyes, I could touch it with my hand, I could taste it with my mouth, but I would disregard it if it was contrary to the word of God. So, you know, my physical senses are, are experiencing a reality in my senses. So I can see how much I owe the bank. I can see how little I've got coming in this week. I can see how much people are getting ill around me. Whatever it might be, I can, my physical senses are experiencing a reality. But my the reality that I subscribe to more than my senses is a thus saith the Lord. Because when we look at um, Hezekiah, the physical reality, because if you listen to what Rabshakeh was saying, he had so much truth in with his error. So when he's talking about the destruction of the cities around them, when he's talking about the, the fact that none of them could protect themselves from the king of Assyria, he's absolutely right. He, the Sennacherib had destroyed, what, 46 French cities in, in the kingdom. And so the people, if they were looking with their eyes, they would have had every reason to believe what Rabshakeh was saying and to disregard Hezekiah and the Lord. But we need to get to the place that even if my eyes are telling me one thing, if it is not in line with the thus saith the Lord, I will be more willing to disregard, disbelieve my own eyes than to disbelieve what God has said will happen. Yes, okay. Amen. So for me, I feel that theme of trust, you know, we're, looking, we're talking about trust, aren't we? So that theme of trust. And self-denial. Yes. And self-denial. So if you look at trust and whom do we trust, how many times in the Bible do we look at this either or, either or? You know, it's Joshua when he stood and said, for me and my house, we are for the Lord. We see this and, you know, and Jesus tells us you can't serve two masters. We know that we need to be on one fence on the other and yet we live our lives as if we are visiting God nine to five and then we're visiting Satan and the things that keep us from God the rest of the time so we are you know we see the prophecies we look at the Laodicean story there's so many references in the Bible that can tell us about the inward experience that we're currently having in current times and yet even though we have all this information, all these resource points available to us, how is that affecting our behaviour today? Um, so I'm asked, this is a clash question to the class. Go on, sorry. Sorry, I thought I heard someone speak. I, I just want to. I want to finish with one really important part of this story it's such a tiny portion in the scripture but it's a significant portion 
I want to talk about when the Babylonian um, emissaries came to visit Hezekiah. So those of you who you are familiar with the story, um, eventually the armies of the Assyrians are defeated by the Lord and turned back. Um, Hezekiah is healed and given an additional 15 years to live. And then after all of this, the Babylonian Empire, they have seen what has happened. They've seen the recovery. Um, and when you read um, Ellen White and when you read some of the other parallel texts, it's almost as if the recovery was as was the biggest standout thing, even as big as, if not bigger than the defeat of the army. And so they had sent people to visit Hezekiah and to see what was going on and to kind of give him some praise and some credit. Mm -hmm. Can anybody tell me what happened and was there any problems in what happened when um, they came to, to visit Hezekiah? Mm -hmm. Instead what happened? Of, instead of giving praise to Jesus to God, mm -hmm. he showed the, the visitors all the treasures he had there. So instead of giving praise to the Lord, he was, as it were, praise giving praise to himself, Most as if definitely. he was so very special. Most definitely. Please, can we go to Second Chronicles chapter thirty-two? There's this, an, an amazing verse here. Second Chronicles chapter thirty-two, amazing verse. Second Chronicles chapter thirty-two, verse thirty-one. So when you read um, Isaiah, I don't know about you, but I had the suspicion that there was something something in the heart of Hezekiah which wasn't righted, <laughs> which wasn't right. It wasn't as it should have been. This was my suspicion. Um, and then when I read through Kings, Second Kings, I had this suspicion was growing in me. But then when I read um, Second Chronicles, my suspicion was actually it was confirmed. So Second Chronicles chapter 32, verse 31. How be it in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. Mm -hmm. God left him to try him so that he would know all that was in his heart. Can I just read it in from this verse? Go for it. Yes, sir. He says, and even when the Babylonian ambassadors came to inquire about the unusual event that had happened in the land, God let Hezekiah go his own way only in order to test his character. Thank you very much. And I wonder what yours version says in 25. I'll read mine. It says, uh, or 24 and 25. In those days, Hezekiah was sick to death and prayed unto the Lord. He spake unto him and he gave him a sign. 25, but Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore, there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Well, my version links in with last week's study. It says, but Hezekiah was too proud to show gratitude for what the Lord had done for him, and Judah and Jerusalem suffered for it. Finally, however, Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem humbled themselves, and so the Lord did not punish the people until after Hezekiah's death. Thank you very much. I see your hand, Monty. I'm coming to you. I just want to say this. It's, it's, a, it's a point which should not be missed. The purpose of God's people, the purpose of God choosing his people, but whether that is Israel, whether that is you and I, is the purpose was not for the benefit of Israel. It was yeah. not because there was something virtuous about Israel. And brothers and sisters, I hate to have to say this to you, but the reason that we are a remnant is not because there's something virtuous about me or virtuous about you. God designed that these people, after receiving his blessings, would be a bright, shining beacon of light for the people around them, and that through the miracles that he had done for Israel, everybody on earth would get to know about him. 
However, when he blessed the people, what did they do with the blessing? What we do with the blessing, put it in our pocket, put it in our bag, and act like, look at this amazing thing that I have done. Look at this amazing thing that I have achieved. Look at this amazing job promotion that I have gained. Mm. And robbing the people and robbing God of the witness due to him, the witness due to him, the Babylonians were supposed to come to Hezekiah and to hear about what has, was going on. And Hezekiah was supposed to say, look at the wonderful things that God has done for me. Look at how merciful God has been. I had 185,000 soldiers at my door, but God delivered me in a moment. I was ill, I was dying, and God healed me. That, if you read um, Patriarchs, Prophets and Kings, it says that if he had done that, there would have been a massive conversion in Babylon. They would have gone back, and that seed would have been sown, and it would have brought forth a miraculous harvest. Yet instead, Hezekiah kept the blessing to himself, exalted himself, and we know, and we, I'm sure we will read as we go on through the quarter, what was the result of that conceit. Yes, Monty. Yeah, I was going to add that it wasn't just Hezekiah's illness and miraculous recovery they were aware of, but the fact that time had been turned back. Because the uh, Babylonians were... were, were um, deep students of um, the stars and of time. And when God turned, the, turned back by 10 degrees, yeah. it meant an hour or two time was stopped. Hezekiah missed the opportunity of sharing with them that my God can turn back time. Your gods can't do that. Instead, yeah. he showed off his wealth and everything he had, even his own armory. He left yeah. nothing um, yeah. as a secret and merely exposed himself for the fool that he was. Mm. Most certainly. I know how I would like to close, but I'll hand over to you, Suki. Um, yeah, I mean, I think everything that I wanted to say has already been said, either by yourself or by Monty. I feel that it's important to reflect upon the lessons that we're learning this week and how it affects us in our current lives. So I would just want to say that in reference to the Babylonians and Hezekiah and have the opportunity to witness to them, <clears throat> we have the opportunity to do the same. So if we think about in the past, how many people have come to visit our church, attend our health expos, come to our tent meetings, eat at our soup kitchen, and what what is their experience of that versus when they come to actually fellowship with us in church you know that disengagement why why do we see that what do we need to do and, you know when Hez hezekiah had the chance to testify and glory by god he took the glory for himself we too have that same responsibility to signpost all to god and allow him to work through us as decreed by the three angels message you know we don't take that opportunity as readily or as regularly as we should and i think certainly right now while we're living through you know what's happening with the virus there are different ways that we should be behaving to, in order to allow God's glory to be testified of. But I'll hand over to you to close, Otis, because we're running quickly, out of time. deeper still, um, Isaiah is an eschatological book, meaning much of what is written in Isaiah is related to the end of time. Now, <clears throat> in summary, God is using his people to witness to the world. And if you read Isaiah, we've already read some of these scriptures, but... God is saying that I am going to do a miraculous thing. I'm going to bring the heathens into the message. I'm going to bring all the, the lands all around. I'm going to convert them. I'm going to, I'm going to bring them in. In the end of time, God's people are going to go through very, very, very troublesome, troublesome, difficult times. And the only way to get through that is going to be by having a faith which is based on not my what I'm seeing, not what I'm feeling, not fear of the unknown or of what I'm seeing, but trust, unshakable trust in God, in his word, and in what he's saying will come to pass. God will do it. God, if we read this, the scripture, we look at Isaiah, we look at um, Hezekiah, but really we should see the mercy the mercy and the love of God. God is desperate for an opportunity for him to show the world who he is. Mm. 
But he can only do that through you and I, as and when we are faithfully trusting in him and allowing him to work things out for his name's honor and glory. So when we try and jump out of his hand and put ourselves in the hand of the Egyptians or the Syrians or whoever it might be, the Ethiopians, all we're doing is robbing God of the opportunity for him to show his glory. Let us develop that faith which is based on a, a thus saith the Lord. And God will do the thing that he has promised. He yes. will do the thing that he has promised. So let us not be tossed and swayed by the things that we are seeing going on around us day by day. Let us develop our relationship with God through his word. And we can say, this is my God. I know he will do the thing that he has said. Um, I, I'm hoping at this time we can have our Bilston Corral meditational. I would have to tell you what I think of Jesus Since I found in him a friend so strong and true I would tell you how he changed my life completely He did something that no other friend could do No one ever cares for me And we'll now have our mission report, and then we will have our closing hymn, which is, I believe, 524, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. How is soccer used for mission in the country of Kyrgyzstan? Winters in Kyrgyzstan are cold, too cold to play outside. But kids love to play year-round. So what are kids expected to do all winter? 
This was a big concern for school leaders at Heritage Christian School. The cold made it hard to have physical education classes. Students had to crowd into a small conference room to exercise. When the weather was nice, the school also hosted a community soccer program for children from low-income families. These kids didn't always have the opportunity to exercise and play sports. In the winter, the soccer field was completely covered in snow. So in 2017, Heritage Christian School asked Adventists around the world to help construct a building. And you answered. This year, we have a special reason to rejoice, because now we have a magnificent building. We were able to build this structure, a multifunctional complex, thanks to the General Conference's 13th Sabbath Offering Project. Students and faculty are thrilled to use the building year-round. It hosts the community soccer program, as well as many other activities. The large building has several meeting areas. An important room is the space where students can gather to talk about their lives and encourage each other. And it doesn't only open its doors to our children and students. We also conduct many programs for teachers, parents, and the community. We invite parents and neighbors to listen to important topics on health, raising children, and strengthening family relationships. Azamat's parents were worried about his education. He had developed an addiction to his computer and smartphone and had a hard time focusing on learning. They chose our school. And so Azamat came here. It was difficult to deal with him because he did not know how to get along with his classmates. He often started quarrels and fights. He was very aggressive, unfriendly, and constantly experiencing anxiety. It was extremely difficult for him. Someone invited him to join the soccer program. The coaches, other children, and the routine taught Azamat how to relate to others and be responsible for his actions. He excelled and learned the sport very quickly. Today, Azamat has changed a lot. He is a wonderful young man who walks with God in his life, trusts him, prays, and asks for wisdom from him, and all thanks to the soccer school. Many lives have been transformed by the influence of this school, and Azamat is just one of them. Thanks to your faithful giving to the 13th Sabbath offering, this building was constructed and is impacting more people than we'll ever know but God knows each and every one. Watching how the young people change, how their vision of life changes, how the reassessment of values take place, you understand that all this is not in vain. God really has an amazing plan, and we feel amazed that He also chose us to participate in it. Please join us in praying for the people of Kyrgyzstan. May this school have a lasting impact on the community. And thank you for supporting the 13th Sabbath offering, which makes all of this possible.
so far and I trust that for the rest of the day it'll be a blessing to have spent this time with us worshipping God we're going to pray let's pray guys dear father in heaven I just want to thank you for the privilege and the honour that is the Sabbath day thank you for calling us apart to be your remnant church thank you for giving us the message and the seeds of truth throughout the history of time through the bible and through your continual long-suffering desire to love us we can see you on the other side waiting desperate to help us guide us save us support us and father all we need to do is reach out and accept that help father give us the strength the courage the acceptance of trusting in you and in you alone helping us to disregard all the things that we see in the world today and help us put all our trust and hopes in you and you alone father god we just pray that you will protect us watch over us and keep us and allow us to walk the path that will lead us to you and to salvation Father, I pray that all of us that are bowed here today, that we will all may have the chance to see you on that glorious day and to be able to fellowship in heaven and to be able to touch the holes in your palms and the holes in your feet and fellowship with you and hug you. Father, we are desperate for that day to come and we just ask that you will help us to be prepared and be ready and to accept the changes that we may need to make in our lives to help us to be equipped for that day. Father, bless us over this rest of this week and throughout the course of this day allow our fellowship to be full and a blessing in jesus name we pray amen amen, amen. 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 amen.